Houston. I'm Mira Rubin here with you on Enlightened World Network. And today's topic is challenging self-perception. And that's kind of a play on words, uh, we, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Before we get started, let's take a couple minutes to just settle in and get present. Let's take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it. And imagine clear, crisp oxygen flooding your lungs, flowing into your bloodstream, nourishing every cell, every organ, filling you with vital life energy. And as you exhale, exhale any fatigue, any tension, any stress, any toxicity. And now let's take another deep breath in through your nose and hold it. This time, imagine brilliant bright light, lightening up every single cell, every molecule, every electron, and energizing, electrifying, and connecting you with the world beyond. And as you exhale, exhale, any remaining fatigue, stress, tension, toxicity. And now let's just gently press our palms together, really softly rub your fingers against your palms and feel how delicious that sensation is. Really allow yourself to sink into it. And with sinking into that sensation, become more present and connected in your body right here, right now. Welcome, welcome, and good morning, Irma. Good morning to everybody else who's here. It's wonderful to have you here. And uh, so we're talking about challenging self-perception. Uh, um, now, we could be looking at that by saying, oftentimes our self-perceptions are really challenging in that uh, we don't tend to see the best of ourselves a lot of times and we can be very self-critical. But um, what I was really intending to talk primarily about this morning is, is making challenges to our self-perception. So, um, and, and in that arena, when we challenge our perception of ourselves, our idea of ourselves, what we're doing is we are expanding beyond the box within which we confine ourselves and the constraints within which we, we limit our experience and our potential in a lot of ways. So the reason that I'm talking about this is that a dear friend of mine is an actor and a, um, a writer and a uh, and um, improvisation improv actor as well, and is teaching an improv class to which they invited me. And initially, my response was improv. Why would I want to do improv? And you know, I I thought this was really it was interesting. It was an interesting dynamic. Uh, because I love this person dearly, and I have seen some of her improv, and she's brilliant and very, very funny, and, um, it, you know, just extremely talented, and, and I, I enjoy, I have deeply enjoyed the experience of that with her, and so I thought about, well, why why would I choose to do this? She sent me a couple articles about how improv has really been profoundly impactful for people who are painfully shy, who have social anxiety, who have uh, issues with depression, who have issues with expression, et, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the uh, opening up the creative aspect was was another part of it, and the the thing that um, really I think hit home for me was this notion of being silly and playing. I I'm from the time I was a kid, I've always been pretty serious, not not goofy, playful for the most part. I have my moments, but for the most part, I've um, pretty, my perception of myself is that I'm pretty serious. And so when I thought about this, I thought, you know, 
I've been invoking more play in my life. That's been a conscious call to uh, the universe and to my higher self and to my being to manifest more play, more joyfulness, more, more um, freedom, more emotional freedom, expansion in my life. And I realized that this, the feeling I was feeling kind of intimidated, I observed all the feelings that were coming up when I was thinking about doing improv and thoughts about looking like an idiot. And, um, and it was so interesting to see all this attachment to, to um, being serious, being credible being um, all these all these other things instead of being able to be playful and to be really responsive and what I realized as I was thinking about this more and more is that um, and actually in one of the articles it said improv is not about being funny improv is about being able to respond to the moment. Good morning, Carol. How wonderful to have you joining us. And good morning, Robert. Great to have you back. So we're talking about uh, challenging self-perceptions. And so I realized that I had all these ideas about myself and that stepping over this the line of the box within which I exist would enable me to move into this place of maybe even greater presence and uh, greater facility, meaning um, flexibility, uh, being able to respond to any situation more lively. Um, and so while having fun and laughing, because I realize I don't have, I don't have tons of laughter in my life, and it would be a lot more fun to have that. So, what I what I saw was this opportunity for dramatic expansion. And interestingly, a lot of folks who have had um, emotional challenges with depression and and um, anxiety, etc., have found transformation really through improv. Now it's an unknown territory for me. And yet um, I think I, I could see where stepping out of my comfort zone, which we've been talking about lately and, and um, challenging my self perceptions can offer me more of the self that I imagine myself to be. So interesting how by taking deliberate steps to challenge our self-perception, in other words, to um, take deliberate steps to challenge our limitations. Hold on, Maggie just dropped her apple onto the floor. For those of you who don't know her, this is Maggie and uh, she she's, just for those who do know her and didn't see her, I wanted you to know she's here, but she's very busily eating her apple this morning. Anyway, um, challenging our self-perceptions allows us to uh, expand more fully into who we are, you know, rather than having this rigid idea that confines and constrains us. And, um, I, I wonder what kinds of opportunities you've given yourself to challenge those perceptions. So we talked about adult learners the other day and how as adults, we're, we're um, averse to failure, right? And um, I, I think that another way to challenge a self-perception is to is to learn something new, right? Because if we, if we have this idea, well, I'm not creative, well then 
take a painting class or or take a class in drawing or in in any number of other kinds of uh, creative expression type endeavors. <laughs> Good morning, Roslyn. Wonderful to have you here. Um, so I think I think that this is a really powerful vehicle for us to explore in in challenging our ideas of ourselves. So even even if what we're noticing isn't aligned with the way that we would love to be. So um, as another personal example, Maggie here uh, has has actually caused me to challenge some of my perceptions. I've thought I'm I, I, I like to think I'm patient and and um, moderated and you know able to respond rather than react. Well she bites me. She bites me a lot sometimes she really hurts me. And when she really hurts me, I react. And the more she really hurts me, the more anxious and upset I have gotten. And finding, finding a pathway through that is really challenging because I find myself like frustrated and angry and, and hurt, you know, like crazy, all these emotions arise. And, um, we have this dynamic. So, you know, like when she does that, I put her in her cage for a timeout. But meantime, it's it's been the way that I register it is has been like, wow, I'm I'm not only physically hurt, but somehow there's an emotional thing about about being hurt as well. And it it, it looking at that dynamic is challenging my self perception to say, okay, well, what's going on there? Who am I in this, you know, that I that I, I get so primal in response to this little creature who has hurt me. Um, so it's, it's interesting. It's interesting to see how um, how we perceive ourselves and also uh, how we can challenge our self-perception in order to grow and expand into something more. So as I, as I notice my reactions to the way that she interacts with me, um, I, I get to develop new behaviors, right? I get to cultivate new behaviors or new attitudes, new approaches. And um, I, I wonder how that shows up for you in your life, how, you're, how you um, challenge your self-perception to expand yourself and, and to become more inclusive, you know, because there's a part of me that has to accept and that chooses to accept the the part that gets really upset around um, you know getting getting hurt and not being able to stop that that external um, that external input in in a way that I would prefer. Let's say I would prefer. I mean, I can stop it by having her be in her cage. I don't want her to have to be in her cage. Uh, so we we have this um, back and forth around, you know, who who is who is um, priority in the moment, I guess. So um, I think also in those moments there's a deep frustration because I don't know how to get. I haven't yet learned. Let's say it that way. I haven't yet learned how to get her to stop. Uh, when she's in one of these these moods, you know, where she's just really aggressive, and um, I, I'll say violent <laughs> because that's my experience so far. I mean, she bites my fingers all the time, but gen no biting, Maggie. Generally, not too hard, and but sometimes she kind of gets in this pecking frenzy and and can really do damage, and so. 
observing ourselves in all these different situations is a way to challenge our perception of ourselves, like how we like to think of ourselves. I like to think that I'm this way or that way or the other way. And then I see that my behavior challenges that. Well, so what's going on? You know, what does that mean? It's not that we are any static thing or behavior. We're not. Uh, we are a spectrum and um, there are nuances. So interestingly, challenging self-perception, right? Um, I, I, in working with some of my clients, um, what I notice, and also with myself, good morning, Isabel, welcome. What I notice is that there are themes do you notice that there are repeating themes in your life where um, you, you have uh, the, the theme maybe of, um, I'm just trying to think. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I, because I'm thinking of a specific, I'm not able to think at the moment of a generality. So well, I'm just gonna talk about themes that recur. So maybe issues of self-esteem that just keep coming up. You get to a point where you feel pretty confident and then there's another, another little niche where, uh-oh, there it showed up again. The same dynamic showed up again and here, you know, you thought you had cleared all that up yet. Here's another little remnant of it. And so we get to keep clearing things up in, in this spiral of evolution uh, where it becomes easier and easier to identify. We have less and less resistance to challenging that perception and we can recognize that there's more space to, to expand into. And um, that's, I think it's a gift. Uh, Rosalind says, societal pressure to have biological kids and a family keeps showing up for me. So Rosalind, one of the things that, um, hmm, so, I would look I would look deeply at your own convictions about having a biological family about bio, having biological kids and a family um, and I I'm saying that because I know for myself I went through a period where I really I decided it was time to have a kid and as a result of that, I got myself into a couple of relationships that I could have, on some, in retrospect, you know, obviously I wouldn't be where I am in this moment if all the, our, all the circumstances of my life hadn't occurred. But, you know, looking back, I would say that they, they weren't the best relationships. Perhaps I, I could have chosen differently if I weren't driven by the biological imperative. And um, I, at some point, when I was clear that that wasn't something I wanted, there was never, I, I did not experience any social pressure at all. And so I, I invite you to look within yourself uh, as far as your clarity about whether or not you want to have kids, whether or not you want to have a family in your heart of hearts. And, and I, I'm gonna take a flyer to say that if you're entirely clear, 100% aligned with not having children and, with, and, and not having a judgment about the importance of that, I know you had said previously that that was something from your father, I believe. Um, it, when you're aligned with it, first of all, his pressure, his pressure, quote unquote, 
won't exist because it'll just be his opinion. It won't be experienced as pressure. And whatever other um, societal pressure might exist, quote unquote pressure, won't be perceived in that way because you'll be really, really clear in your own knowing, in your own certainty. And if, see, this is where you get to challenge your self-perception. Perhaps you, you believe that you're not interested in having kids, but there's some part of you that still does believe that that's a, a woman's most important role or a person's most, a human being's most important role on the planet. There may be part of you that still believes that. And um, I, you know, I, I'm going out on a limb here because I don't know you and I don't, uh, I don't know the intimacy of your situation or your decision, but that's been my experience with myself and with clients is that when we experience outside pressure, it's because we're creating it from within on some level. And um, so again, I just invite you to challenge that that perception of yourself to recognize, you know, what's fully there. You know, maybe there, maybe there is a place where that is a conviction for you to have a child that, that you have been avoiding, or maybe there's been that, that underlying belief about the importance of having children that you get finally to free yourself from. I, I, hope for you that that's the case. I mean, there's certainly there are age, um, age specific social conversations. Um, uh, and, and the thing is that if, if there is a part of you that truly wants to have a child, then there, there is a, um, especially a biological child, there's an age constraint around that, um, unless you froze your eggs or something like that. But uh, I, I invite you to dig deeply because this is, this is interesting and, and I'm, it's pretty personal, but I'll share it. So I had a hard growing up for me emotionally. I mean, I don't, I don't know that my situation was any worse than, than other people's, but I registered it really deeply. You know, it was extremely traumatic for me. And at one point when I was young, I said, I'm never getting married and I'm never having kids because I don't want to do to them what my family has done to me. And, and I was very much feeling a victim. And I was very much uh, like a super sensitive person. So, you know, the way that, that I experienced, like I said, the way that I experienced my world was probably magnified a thousandfold from what other people would have perceived and experienced. So I, I'm giving that caveat. Well, I made, uh, it's almost like I made that, um, almost like I cast a spell at that time you know, on myself. And then at, at the, from the time I was 15, I really wanted to have a child and which is really interesting, right? And then, and as I um, got older, I, I didn't find the right person and I made that the reason for not having a child. And I have to say that I am very grateful not to have had a child. And at some point, I really became clear that I didn't want, I really didn't want to have a child. I didn't want to have a conventional family because I, and, and really for me in my path, it has served me because I would never have had the opportunity to grow and evolve and change and, and make the radical changes in my being, in my way of being, in my lifestyle in my pursuits that I have had the opportunity to do as an individual, an independent individual. So 
you know, I'm, I'm sharing that by way of acknowledgement of what it is to have that kind of drive, that kind of uh, biological imperative kind of thing. And, and maybe the other side of it or another side of it. And I'm not saying that this is something I advocate for others. It's something that just is, is my own personal experience. My deepest commitment my whole life has been to awakening and to evolving. And I don't believe, especially based on what I've seen in marriages, even good ones, I don't believe that I would have had the, the unbounded freedom for growth uh, of the kind that I've made in my life if I had had a more traditional um, context. So Rosalind says, it's getting easier to uh, letting go over the years. I thought I closed the door on kids already. So I'll keep looking within why this issue keeps popping up its head like the Loch Ness Monster. Well, if it's like the Loch Ness Monster, Rosalind, it's absolutely calling for your attention. Um, and that's it. And it is an internal thing. And Tammy says, hello and welcome, Tammy. Great to have you here. And Rosalind says, thank you for uh, showing, sharing your experience and story and how you move through it. You're welcome. Uh, you know, I, I, I did not grieve for not having a child. In fact, I, I think that it's only now in my evolution that I, I really could be a really, really good mom. Um, I, I know that I was struggling with healing myself, healing my family for years and years and years. And even now, like with Maggie, when she hurts me, physically hurts me, um, to see how reactive I get, even now, I, I can imagine I wouldn't really want to be doing that to a child. I wouldn't want to be just so completely spent that I couldn't be um, loving and present and all those, you know, the, the perfection of motherhood kind of idea. So um, I, I, I think that, um, I, I call young people into my life and they hold me as a mentor in some, in some cases, which is wonderful, you know, to be able to uh, be there as a, um, as, as a guide, you know, to share some direction and wisdom in some situations and that's a real gift that I cherish. Um, but yeah, I think, I think that there are so many ways that we come into our fullness and into our worthiness and our worth in this world. And first of all, know that worthiness and worth is an internal experience, really. It's not based on something external like whether we have kids or whether we have a big house or whether we have a great job or whether we um, beg on the street or whether we, you know, it, our, our worth, we're all here contributing to this, this magnificent symphony of life. We're all here contributing our part and there are myriad expressions of life through expressing itself through us. And um, I hope, I hope Rosalind, that you can find uh, reconciliation with yourself around this, uh, this notion that keeps showing up like a monster, maybe have a conversation with that monster. Instead of trying to um, just conquer it, maybe you can have a conversation with it. It might have some wisdom for you and some insight. So um, yeah, it's interesting how 
uh, our perceptions, challenging self-perceptions, uh, how we have different perceptions at different times of our lives and we express different parts of ourselves at different times in our lives. And we reprioritize things radically based on where we are in our lives. So the thing about having children, a lot of people try to have children to find fulfillment of some sort or another. And I, I see that for many people, the greatest achievement they have is, is their children. Um, and I, I know other people who feel completely bereft and devastated at the, the loss of children or the, the estrangement from children or tremendous disappointment in children. And, and the, the, the thing for me is that when we can raise children as individuals that have their own autonomy, um, that's a beautiful thing. Good morning, Abdul, Abdul Fattah. Welcome, welcome. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. And um, the, the, the vision for me is that we are able to raise our children consciously. And hello, Pat, good afternoon to you, um, that we can that we can have, that we can propagate, whether to our children or other human beings, that we can propagate evolutionary values, values that are gonna take us beyond our cultural and, um, and hereditary, culturally hereditary and genealogically hereditary patterns that we can evolve and, and that we can grow beyond uh, the, the uh, limited self perceptions that keep us stuck in cycles of despair and destruction globally you know, that, that we have this notion of uh, to, to be able to evolve out of the notion of separation and into a um, greater, deeper connection and collective awareness, because that's what we need on the planet right now. You know, our, right now we're facing really, really catastrophic consequences if we don't make rad radical changes within 10 years, within less than 10 years, globally, as a human race. There, we have an urgent, urgent call to transform, to transform our way of thinking to transform our way of interacting with the world, the way we consume things, the way we try to um, overcome or, or control or fight or, or dominate, the way we try to dominate our, our uh, world. If we don't change radically now, then we're we're doomed, and I don't, I you know I'm not. This is not a. Uh, this is not an idle conversation. So we get to wake up. We get to do whatever we need to do to wake up, and to and to step outside 
these limited self perceptions of ourselves in our own little worlds, in our own little boxes, in our own, in our own little families, even, we, you know, we get to step outside our, our perception of ourselves as incompetent or incapable of making a global change and instituting change beyond ourselves. Why do we want to have children in so many ways? It's to carry on our lineage, right? In, in so many ways, it's to experience an intimacy that we don't know how else to experience. You know, and why else do we have children to be able to uh, pass on a legacy? Well, now we have the opportunity to expand our, our self-perception into the, the world and to extend our legacy into the world by bringing this awareness and, and taking us beyond uh, into a realm of true possibility for the future of all humanity. So Rosalind says, your precious show explaining the Dickens process was a powerful shift for me to make changes for a different outcome. I'm so glad, oh, you said previous show. I'm so glad that was powerful for you, Rosalyn, because the Dickens process really, really does help us to move beyond our, our limited self-perception. And that's what we need to do is to challenge the self-perception that we're limited. And to realize that we all, if we all, if we all take it on right now, to step out and wake ourselves up and share that awakening to, hey, let's, we can make a difference. Let's take some action. Let's do something here that's going to shift this um, trajectory of, of uh, climate change, of overconsumption, of single use plastics, of, you know, of, of a throwaway society. Let's take the action we need to take to make a difference in the world. If we can shift our self-perception to from the belief that I can't do anything to the belief that that's what I'm here for, um, then we have some hope. We have some hope. And I have hope that you are part of that hope and part of that solution. So Abdullah Fattah says, actually, you're speaking to the tr speaking the truth. Come to think of it, I vividly remember my father told me the there told me how their time was growing up. Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you for sharing that, Abdullah Fattah. Um, I, I had no expectation that this was going to take the path of wake up people, you know, let's, let's do this together. Let's change our self perception, challenge our self perception from limited to limitless and see what we can bring to the world of our gifts, of our vision, of our light, of our love. And together, let's create a world that works. We can do this. We can. We can save the world. When we do it together. And that's the key. So um, we get to challenge our self-perception of being isolated and alone. Right? We get to step into being part of a global family. We get to be daring and and bold and courageous in, in stepping beyond our limits. And if it's something like improv that gets you to speak more freely and feel more capable of um, interacting with the unknown, then do it. And um, I think that's it for today. I'm so grateful to have you with me. I'm so grateful to share this time together. Um, you, you are all such a gift and you all have a brilliant light to share. And uh, 
I'm Mira Rubin. This is The Core Connection. I go live each weekday morning on Enlightened World Network and uh, on the Facebook page. So please check out the other awesome programming and the rich community on Enlightened World Network. And Irma, thank you for being here and all of you. And uh, I hope that you'll be joining us all again soon, all of you. Robert says, yes, we have to step into our power of being part of the solution exactly, rather than being at the effect of it, rather than feeling helpless and hopeless. We get to step in and um, be heard and be seen and be visible, be expressed, be engaged, be the light. And Rosalind says, connected, not alone, courageous, not fearful, love and light to you all. Beautiful, beautiful, everybody. So much love.